Tainted Grail The Fall of Avalon is a grimdark open world RPG based on Arthurian legend. Its mechanics and gameplay borrow heavily from the Elder Scrolls games, though it exists in a much darker setting, which I kind of found to be closer to Elden Ring and other Souls games. A short while ago, the developers reached out to me and wondered if I'd be interested in making a review of the game, which is just released in early access. I took a look at some demos, read up on the world it's based in, liked the look of it, and decided to give it a go. So let's break down the core elements of this game, weigh up what it does well and still needs to work on, before before asking, is it worth your time? Before we begin, massive shout out to the supporters over on Patreon who allow me the freedom to make more of the content I enjoy. I'm not sponsored to make a review on this game, rather I agreed to because I genuinely want to, the game has promise and it's my sort of thing. Though they did let me try out the digital and tabletop versions for free, so just bear that in mind. This video though is my brutally honest opinion, much of which is good, but by no means perfect. So without further ado, let's get into it. Starting conveniently at the beginning with this atmospheric main menu complete with throat singers to set the vibe and an image of a hooded skull statue. This is a men here and there'll be a very important element later. Taking a peek at the controls, I realise that they're pretty similar but not identical to Skyrim's. A fact which was actually quite good as I already had several hundred if not over a thousand hours of muscle memory for these gameplay mechanics already. That said, they have expanded on those mechanics, notably with proper dodging and a heavier focus on parrying. Clicking new game, we get a brief summary summarising cutscene about how King Arthur and Merlin once cleansed the land of plague and weirdness, which I'll explain more about shortly, and then we're straight into character creation. Pretty basic as it goes with a select option of presets for different features, body type, facial structure and hair being the main ones. Honestly though, for a first person game which is just entering early access, I'm kinda glad they didn't dedicate too much time to this yet, and instead focused on the much more important and noticeable mechanics, settings and characters, each of which we'll get to. First though, let's see where exactly our adventure begins. And well, it begins as you might expect. In a cell underground, there lived a prisoner. And through our first and only interaction with the cell guard, we can decide our backstory and start in class. I chose to be a stealthy thief who's good with bows, as I think it's a very underrated class in games that not many people have tried, but I have a feeling will be pretty powerful. A moment later, this guy called Caradoc shows up and breaks us out for as of yet unexplained reasons. We then go through a 45 minute prison escape prologue which you may have experienced if you played the free demo of this game. During this we experience our first taste of combat through swords, bows and magic. If you're feeling particularly thorough there's also a ton of reading material to pick up and go through, and doing so will further inform you on the world in which Fall of Avalon is set and flesh out your overall understanding. Stories like Beautiful Liliana in the Chamber of Ecstasy also continue a particular trend of certain in-game literature. Additionally we get a nice taste of the game's bizarre, sometimes dreamlike set pieces which you can see on screen now. Fall of Avalon features a lot of big monolithic set pieces. It feels very much like a world that's been roamed by giants, leaving a whole host of ginormous buildings and statues behind. Anyway, finally escaping from the prison, we're dropped the bombshell plot point that King Arthur is back from the dead and we need to kill him again. So setting sail for the mainland, we wake up shipwrecked in the Horns of the South, the main area available in this current version of the game. Now, as I said, Tainted Grail The Fall of Avalon is a grimdark RPG. Grimdark generally meaning a very bleak, often post-apocalyptic setting where the fate of humanity is generally hopeless, and the characters themselves are all often morally ambiguous. The term I think originates from Warhammer 40k, which is a far future where there is literally only war. And there's also a bit of debate over whether or not Game of Thrones is a grimdark story or just contains elements of it. Personally, I'd say comparing this game to Game of Thrones isn't a bad start in establishing the type of moral grey tone that it's going for. Set 600 years after the reign of King Arthur, the world appears to be suffering from all kinds of woes. Plague, famine, you name it. Not to mention the bizarre primordial force known as the Weirdness, which keeps cropping up to provide people with random mutations like growing horns, tails, or being turned inside out. Indeed, this game also uses its bleak and grim setting to lean heavily into grotesque horror elements, which at times works to great effect and can be pretty scary. Take this underground mine, for example. To start off with, we have to dive to the bottom of a lake filled with blood, and then we have to fight off hordes of possessed miners, some of whom have literally resorted to mining with their bare hands to the extent that they've ground them to stumps. Reaching the bottom of the mine will uncover an ancient chamber housing this strange entity whose design kind of reminds me of the work of H.R. Geiger, who created the xenomorphs from Alien. Now I'm not going to spoil this quest further, but what I will say is that Fall of Avalon has a very rich and deep amount of lore, which comes across well in the bizarre but awesome set pieces like this, which are definitely one of the most 
most standout elements here, and one of the main things that drew me to it in the first place. Now let's talk about the combat systems in place here. I said at the start that I was just going to be a stealth archer again and tank everyone from afar, but you know what? As I played, the game actually did a decent job of making me try other weapons and spells that were on offer. Arrows aren't utterly abundant immediately, so for their conservation I also had to engage in melee. Using a sword has actually probably been my favourite way to do combat in fact, and rather than just levelling up and becoming stronger, it actually forced me as a player to get better in order to stop dying constantly. Sound familiar? No, I'm not saying the game is in any way Souls-like. I'm just saying that unlike other RPGs, where you hack, slash, and level up to take on stronger enemies in the same way, I did find myself needing to employ a little bit more skill here. Pressing alts to dodge away from attacks is very effective, but does drain stamina, a stat which drains very quickly in general, but replenishes after a moment or two. I also had to get better at blocking in the last moment to perform a parry, as staggering my enemy was often the only way to get in uncontested hits and not lose all my health in the fight. Healing potions do exist, but I found they were few and far between, and most of the time I'd be replenishing my health by cooking up different ingredients into food. The cooking mechanic is pretty fun, and having a basic knowledge of cooking and combining different ingredients in real life will definitely help you out here. I also discovered a wolf summon spell which diverted enemies' attention away from me, allowing for a welcome respite from constant assault, though wolves did become a little useless after reaching higher level enemies who could one-shot them. I also found enemy tracking sometimes would have them chasing the wolf, even if I was swinging right next to them. Now, I'm not really one to complain when I find an exploit, but this enemy behaviour just feels a little unrealistic. Again, bear in mind this game is still in its adolescence, and the devs themselves have said it lacks polish at the current stage. I won't lie, it's quite noticeable at times, and exploring the main open world especially, there's often clunky moments where I assume assets are loading in and out. Still, it's lovely to look at, and I'm sure as things develop, issues like these will disappear. I think they're hoping that with community input, they'll get a lot of useful feedback to improve on mechanics like this. In fact, there's even a report bug feature in the pause menu. The devs are actively seeking player inputs, and it seems they genuinely care about making their game as good as possible over this next stage of development. Something I was already very impressed by, however, is just how much effort they've put into fleshing out each and every NPC. The main keep that you'll head to after being shipwrecked is heavily populated by guards known as keepers. They're stationed on walls, in courtyards, inside specific buildings, and when normally I'd expect many of these characters to be basic nameless nobodies, that couldn't be further from the truth. Everybody I talked to had an established and unique personality, as well as often a quest or two. There's established relationships between different people, and just generally a lot of voice to dialogue if you're interested in learning about the world and the characters within it. A chat with Keeper Gwillen right the way up here draws attention to the seagull problem which comes with manning the coastal walls. Bloody seagulls! Can you hear me? You, you, you flying vermin! What the seagulls? So we wind up learning about and crafting an elaborate feathered mask to scare them away, which he'll then wear for the rest of time, seemingly. We've also got Keeper Pate, who taught me that sometimes a basic good deed can turn into a horrible situation. The guy can't read, but I can. So he asks me to read the letter that he's received from his sister. Thanks letters. To me? I I'm so proud of her. Oh, thanks. Here's the letter. Well, turns out his dad's been killed at home, and his mother's not looking great either. Fuck. And I'm now the one landed with the burden of delivering this terrible news. Everyone's healthy. No, you must have misunderstood something. Anyway, that's just two encounters, but literally anyone you meet here will have some kind of unique interaction and personality. It's very impressive for a studio of this size, and is hopefully something they can keep up as they expand the game with new regions. As I understand it, the land's mostly been ravaged, and the population is pretty sparse, a factor which definitely works in favour of making sure that every remaining NPC outside of bandits is a proper character. Now, I mentioned before Horns of the South being the main area in this version of the game, but if we take a look at the full world map of the tabletop game on which this is based, you'll notice that this is merely a tiny corner of Avalon overall. 41 different cards make up this map, and this is just the first two of them. Now, whilst I'm not certain whether the devs are planning to implement all of this into the full game, from the sounds of it on their Steam page, they have, quote, a lot of additional content, end quote, to come. But for now, I can't pretend that it's a perfectly polished 
game yet, and they've literally acknowledged the same thing, which is very honest and rare for a game studio to do. But you know what? I also played Cyberpunk at launch. I can look past the odd bug and clunky mechanic if the story and world is engaging, and I see a lot of scope and promise here. I think in the future, as this develops, it'll be a really strong Scrolls-like grimdark game. Can we do that? Can we say Scrolls-like for Elder Scrolls-like games, or is that just going to confuse people with Souls-like? Anyway, I managed to get 7 hours of gameplay in before creating this video, and apparently there's currently 10 to 15 in total. I can't wait to get back and discover the rest of it, and I look forward to seeing how it develops over the next 9 to 16 months. That's the amount of time the devs have said early access is expected to last, with tons of updates and new content coming within that. So the ultimate question, Tainted Grail The Fall of Avalon, is it worth your time? Well, if you're looking to fill the void left by Skyrim and Oblivion before Elder Scrolls 6, but don't mind an even darker and bleaker tone, then yeah, by all means, you'll have the chance to help guide the game into the polished piece of brilliance which it one day has the potential to become. I really do believe that. Smaller studios often produce games with the most soul, and Awaken Realms has just over 30 people working on this one. They often have a lot more creative freedom to do what they want, as opposed to bigger companies who are often tied into more of a corporate web and simply forced to make money in the easiest possible way by taking very few risks and just selling strings of cosmetics. It's actually very nice to see a game which harkens back to a simpler time, and it's why I agreed to do a video on it, simple as that. But I fully understand that many of you will be wanting, you know, a completed game before you buy it, and I can't really argue with that sentiment. Either way though, link to the Steam page is in the description if you want to check it out, whether that's to try it for yourself or just follow along with its progress. With all the details and obscurities games like this often have, I'd love to make some more content content on this one as it grows in size and popularity. So like the video and comment below if that's something you'd like to see. That's all for today, thanks for watching, I'm Sam Bram, and I'll see you soon in another video.